Thank you, Josh. Well, thank you, choir and orchestra, and thank you, Josh and Laney and Ellie. Uh, earlier today, um, the music has been so focused on, uh, on our Lord this morning. His name, his power, his salvation. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to the 10th chapter of Luke's Gospel. If the Bible is a new book for you, uh, there are those provided in the pew rack in front of you. Just in case you, you don't have one, and if you need one, let us know. We will get you a Bible. But it's divided into two parts. There's the, uh, the first two-thirds of the Bible. It's called the Old Testament. It's the story of God in creation. It's the story of God choosing a people through whom he re would reveal himself to all the nations, to all the people of the earth. Uh, that was the nation of Israel. And in that old part of the book, God promised that he would send a Savior one day who would pay the penalty for all the sins of mankind, and that Savior is Jesus. So the second part of the Bible is the New Testament, the last one-third. And there are 27 writings that make up the New Testament. Four of those, the first four, are called the Gospels, the Good News. And they're written by four different men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, it gives a little different perspective on the life and ministry of Jesus in each one. We're in the third gospel this morning, the gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter. And we're going to read verses 38 through 42. So let's do what we did earlier. Let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Scripture says, now as they were traveling, and the they there is Jesus and his 12 disciples... Jesus entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word seated at his feet. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him. She came up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha... Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are necessary, really only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. May God add his richest blessings to the reading of his word, and may his Holy Spirit apply the preaching and the teaching of his word to your heart and to my heart this day. Please be seated. I picked up the Abilene Reporter News on Thursday morning and uh, read the headline, It's Emotional on the First Day of School. And I know that's true. I have a wife who's a school teacher, been teaching for 30-something years, and uh, it's, uh, it's a tricky day, that first day of school. But I looked at the picture and I said, wait a minute, I know that person. She sings in our choir. She sits either right here or right here on Sunday morning in our 9 o'clock service. I used to know her as Karen Smith. I now know her as Mrs. Ben James, Karen James. She is in her 11th year of teaching at Ortiz Elementary. She teaches second graders. And it's a wonderful article all about the first day of school for second graders and what Miss James does to help her children. You know, they, they've been at home all summer long. They've, they've been under mom's protective care and now they're going back to school to a new teacher, a new classroom, new students, new classmates, and it can be a tough day. So what Karen does for her children on that day, she reads a book and the book is entitled First Day Jitters by Julie Danberg. The newspaper says the story features a character who's terrified to go to school on the first day and tries to avoid it by hiding in bed under the covers. In the car, the, the character looks out and sees the principal, and the character is afraid of the principal. The character gets down and hides behind uh, in the car, and just all day long, things like that. And you come to the end of the first day jitters, and you find out that the character is not a child, not a student. It's one of the teachers. And they're afraid of first day. Everybody has some jitters about going to school on that first day. It's first day of Sunday school for a lot of people today. New classes. I'm happy to report. We, we were doing all of Multiply. Or not all of it, but part of the motivation was to create space for worship in the latter hour, the 1030 hour. We would run about 70 to 80 at 9 o'clock in the gathering, but then close to 400 in the late hour. 
I'm happy to announce we had 209 in the early hour of the gathering. That creates space in the upper hour, the 1030 hour, this hour, for more folks to come and worship there. So it's an exceptionally good morning in the gathering. And right now, we have a lot of new Sunday school classes being taught and a lot of uh, kids that are in Sunday school. So, so that can be a, a jittery day for some folks. And it's not, it's not just going to school. It's not just the first day of school. It's not just teachers and coaches and band directors and counselors and, and administrators and parents and, and children. But, but there are a lot of occasions in life that create the jitters and turmoil like the situation we just read about in Luke chapter 10. You have two sisters, Mary and Martha, that invite Jesus, the man they believe is God's Messiah. They invite him for a meal, and they are so excited when Jesus accepts their invitation. Both sisters want everything to be just right. Both sisters work feverishly in preparation to make it so. But when Jesus arrives, unexpectedly Mary stops doing everything. And she sits down at Jesus' feet. She takes, she assumes the position of a disciple. And she wants to take in everything Jesus has to say. When she does that, big sister Martha, and the text doesn't say that Martha's the big sister, but I think she's the big sister. She erupts in this uncontrollable outburst of frustration and anxiety. This perfect occasion and event suddenly fell completely apart and she tries to draw Jesus into her personal anxiety. Lord, don't you even care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Lord, tell her to help me. Wow, can you imagine how stressed out she had to have been to lose it like that in front of Jesus. But Jesus responds so calmly, so instructively. He says to her, Martha, and if you'll notice in the text, he has to say it twice. It's kind of like the first time she doesn't even hear him. She's so angry. She's huffing and puffing. He says, Martha, oh, Martha. And she hears him the second time and turns. He says, you're worried, you're bothered, you're upset by so many things. He says, there's only a few things that are really important. In fact, today, just one. And Mary has chosen that one thing. It's the only thing that cannot be taken away from her. She's made the best choice. Namely, fellowship with Jesus. That timely word of wisdom coming from the lips of our Savior 2,000 years ago is as relevant today as it was for Mary and Martha. Father of a third grade daughter spoke to a church staff member about the challenge of raising this eight-year-old girl. He spoke to her, or he spoke to, to the staff member saying that he and his wife are trying to survive this, this incredible onslaught of peer pressure. Not children putting pressure on their daughter, but parents putting pressure on them. And you may know what that's like. The insistence of their friends that make sure your daughter gets exposed to all the opportunities that are out there for eight-year-old girls. They've been told they need to get her involved in a full set of sports, including soccer, softball, basketball, and volleyball. Not only that, but she must take dance, and not just ballet, but tap and modern as well. They need to make certain that she's in social, whatever that is. She should also take up gymnastics just in case she wants to be a cheerleader someday. And she should also take piano. Every little girl's got to play the piano. And she really needs to be up on all the latest computer technology, eight years old. All of this in addition to what she's doing at school and what she's doing in her church activities. The father said, it's overwhelming. My wife and I finally decided the other night to just ignore what everyone is telling us and simply show our daughter a few of the good things in a timely way and hopefully avoid the risk of making her a complete neurotic. We will show her a few of the good things in a timely way. I think Jesus would say they've made the good choice. They've chosen the right thing. I've about come to the conclusion that in America, we worship at the altar of opportunity. We believe that 
the more opportunities a person has, the better chance they will have of being a success in life and being happy in life. And while that may hold some weight and while that may be partially true and while living in the land of opportunity does have its benefits, the truth of the matter is we're not exceptionally good about choosing between opportunities. More often than not, we, we push ourselves and our children to try everything that life offers. I guess so we won't have any regrets later on in life. But in our relentless pursuit of all that life offers, we lose sight of the fact that unfortunately, many of those opportunities leave nothing but regret in their wake. I was doing the math last night. I can't believe it's been 13 years since we sent our youngest son off to college. 13 years ago this August, Hogan left Abilene to go to Waco. And it was parents uh, orientation weekend or week. And we, we went, Claudia and I were part of it. And we went to some of the, the lectures that were given. One of them was by a business professor in the business school, 30 minute talk to incoming freshmen about managing their time, the practicalities of time management. One of the best pieces of advice he gave was this. He said, as a first semester freshman, you need to say no seven times for every time you say yes. Give seven no's for every one yes. He said, when you're in your dorm room studying or your cubicle in the library, working on that assignment that's due tomorrow, and some of your pals come up and say, hey, blow that off. Let's go to CeCe's, eat pizza, and watch the game on the big screen. Or let's go to the marina and rent a kayak and go paddling down the Brazos River. Let's go to the athletic complex and watch the football team practice. Let's go to the Baptist Student Ministries Bible study they're offering tonight. Or let's go to this sorority function or to this rush function that the fraternity's having. He said, all those things are good. All those things are fine. But at that moment, they are not the best choice. They're not the right choice choice. Jesus would say, those aren't the good part. That's not the good part. So you see why I'm drawn to this text as we're beginning a new school year. Some of our students have been there for the last three days, Abilene ISD. Others started a little bit earlier. College students start this week. It, it's not, this text is not just for students. It's not just for teachers. It's for all of us. When life is full of choices and life gets hectic and chaotic and we feel like we're up to our necks in water or our, our heads are almost below the water, we, we, we need to hear once again these choice words of wisdom from the lips of our Savior. Most of us have too many things going on. Most of us have committed ourselves to the point of overcommitment. We're trying to spend too many plates Keep too many balls in the air at one time. Like Martha, most of us are worried about too many things. We need to be reminded of the few right things, the necessary things, the things that matter most. As Jesus would say, the good part. So if you're taking notes this morning, I want to be brief, but I want to give you a few things that really matter. A few of the right things. First of all, it's it's more important to do the right things than to try to do everything perfectly right. Think about Mary and Martha. Martha's the one who's consumed. She's the one who's so concerned about doing things right. She's probably the perfectionist of the two. She's obsessed with schedules and she's obsessed with orderliness and she's obsessed with, with appearances. Curb appeal. When Jesus arrives, I want everything to look just right. Feng shui once he comes to the house, whatever that is. I've heard it on Home and Garden TV. The feng shui, everything balanced in our house just right. That's Martha. Mary is the more contemplative one. She's the soulful sister. Mary's always asking why. Why is it so important that we do this? Will it really matter in the long run? What difference will it make? You know, it's possible, it's possible to do a lot of things right and still do life wrong. Think about this. 10, 15 years after this day that Jesus comes for the meal, 10, 15 years after their brother Lazarus died and then was raised by Jesus, years later, do you think either of these two sisters or any of the disciples remembered that everything was just perfect that day, that all the rolls were perfectly browned? Do you think that they remembered, oh, there was that little stain on the tablecloth or on my napkin? 
Do you think any of that really mattered in the long term? No, if Mary hadn't brought the two sisters back to their senses, they'd have looked back on that day 15 years later and realized how wrong it had been to worry about all the details and ignore their guests. Ignore Jesus. I mean, the Son of God was coming to their house for a meal. That's no time to obsess over chocolate bars or lemon squares. Brownies or lemon squares. I vote for both, but in life, there are plenty of things you must do right. At work, at school, in our relationships, at home, at church. There are lots of procedures to follow. There are lots of rules to obey. But there are a few right things you can afford to ignore. Once again, it's more important to do the right things than to do everything perfectly right. Here are some of the right things we must do. First of all, you must be a trustworthy person. You must be a person that other people can trust. That characteristic, trustworthiness, is the single most important factor in personal relationships as well as professional success. And it is your actions that determine whether people can trust you or not. So do what, you're going, do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. How often? How about always? Be predictable in that way. Keep your promises to everyone, but especially to your children, to your parents, and to your spouse. If you're a person that others can trust, they'll listen to you, they'll respect you, they'll follow you. But if you always say one thing and do something else, nobody's going to follow. They may tolerate you, but they'll question everything you say and everything you do. So one right thing to do is be a person that others can trust. Secondly, be a responsible person. Be a person of responsibility. Every day, do what you should do before you do what you want to do. Let me say that again. Every day, do what you should do before you do what you want to do. A big part of doing the right thing is following through on your responsibilities. Young people, that includes your homework. That includes your chores around the house. And if your parents haven't been wise enough to give you any chores, then you be wise enough to ask for some. Because I guarantee you, it'll pay off in the long run, big time. Being responsible includes the things you've obligated yourself to do, like paying your debts completely and on time. It includes following through on your commitments, including giving your tithes and your offerings. Again, do what you should do before you do what you want to do. And this really does include the little things. Often it's the little things that'll make you or break you. When Fred Acock was our church business administrator, if he was thinking about hiring someone and he was in that interview process and he was convinced they had the skills, they could do whatever this job called for. Before he offered them the job, he said, okay, here are three things that I expect. Number one, show up. That's pretty basic. If you get this job, you need to show up. Secondly, you need to show up on time. And third, you need to show up on time, ready to work. That's it. But those will make you or they'll break you. You've probably seen the sign or the bumper sticker that says, don't sweat the small stuff. And by the way, it's all small stuff. That may be true with regards to worrying about things, but when it comes to being a responsible person and doing the right thing, the little things do matter. I like to play golf. Golf has barriers. It's called out-of-bounds stakes. And it doesn't matter if you hit your golf ball one inch out-of-bounds or a mile out-of-bounds like I do. It's all out-of-bounds. It's all a two-stroke penalty. And if you cross the line in life, in your values, you cross that line by an inch or by a mile, you're still out of bounds. When it comes to being responsible, you do sweat the small stuff. Somebody said every day you ought to do at least two things that you don't like doing just for practice. 
Sometimes that may include doing something you're responsible for doing. There are seasons in life, at work, at church, in our families, at school, where you have to do something you just don't necessarily enjoy doing, but it's, it comes with the territory. It's part of what you signed up for. You know, as a carpenter, I'll bet there were parts of the job that Jesus didn't just absolutely love. Having to go out in the heat of the sun, find that one piece of timber that was just right, fell the tree and then clean the tree and then drag it all the way back to the carpenter shop in Nazareth and then prepare the wood so he could later finally apply his creative skills to it. All the preparation work probably wasn't the most fun part of the job, but he had to do it. As a responsible carpenter, as a responsible person, Jesus knew and lived by the principle, you do what you should do before you do what you want to do. That's being responsible. And that's one of the right things we must do, along with being trustworthy. And then the third right thing we must do is accept the consequences of our actions. Don't blame others for your mistakes or for the choices that you make. Refuse to be a victim. Don't whine about your circumstances and how everybody else always gets the breaks and you never do. If you're a teacher, don't moan and groan because you got two or three students, you've been watching them as they've been coming up through the grades and you were just hoping they wouldn't land in one of your classrooms, but you got those two or three students and you're complaining to everybody else about it. Don't do that because every other teacher got two or three students that they were hoping you would get. It's just like pastors. Every pastor has two or three. I'll finish that sentence in about a year from now. You know, my wife, Claudia, has been teaching for 30-something years in Texas and three or four years in Louisiana. So she's got a lot of experience. We got married on August, oh, Saturday, August the 7th, 1976. So it's 43 years ago. We got married in Denver. We honeymooned in Taos. Got married on Saturday. On Tuesday, telephone rang. Now, I was pastor of a country church in Belton, Texas, and was getting ready to start seminary in Fort Worth. So Waco was about halfway between Belton and Fort Worth, 84 miles to seminary and 51 miles to our church. I was getting paid $200 a month. That was it. Um, Claudia didn't have a job. She had a teaching certificate, degree in history and a degree in Greek, but, but just a, 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 and a teaching certificate, but no job offers. Tuesday afternoon on the honeymoon in Taos, the telephone rings, and I still know how they got our phone number at the Kachina Motor Lodge, but they did. <laughs> Telephone rings, and it's the Waco Independent Schools. They said, Claudia, if you want a job, be here on Thursday morning. This is Tuesday afternoon. We got in the Volkswagen. We were in Waco Wednesday night, 11 o'clock at night, and she started to work the next day. Our honeymoon was uh, cut tragically short, and it has had a negative effect on our marriage ever since, as you can tell. But <laughs> she taught two years mainstream history, eighth graders, U.S. history, and then she left the classroom for, for two years when we were offered the youth position at Columbus Avenue Church in Waco, where I was still in seminary, so they hired both of us. They called us both to come and serve as youth pastors with the understanding that once I graduated, Claudia would go back to teaching school. Well, it's funny how God works, but during that year and a half or two years that she was out of the classroom, she tutored a high school students from our church whose dad turned out he was the director of personnel for Waco schools. And Claudia was helping him in math and English and history and, and uh, in, in physics and all these classes that he had. And the kid's dad realized that this gal can teach a lot of things. She'd be great for the alternative school. Now, the alternative school is the school where students go when they've been suspended for the school year, not just two or three days, but for the whole year. So Claudia took that position. Her third year of teaching, she's teaching the kids that have been kicked out of school for the year. You start off with uh, maybe three students, and as the year progresses, you get more and more students. At the end of the year, maybe you got 12 or 15 students. And you have to teach them whatever class, whatever they've been taking, whether a seventh grader or a ninth grader or a senior. So you might be teaching senior English and might be teaching freshman math, and you might be preaching or teaching science and, uh, to, a, to a seventh grader. You've got all these different classes that you're teaching. But those kids are there because they got in trouble. One day, one of the students, I think it was a little eighth grade boy, Claudia was helping him with his math, and he looked up and he said, so Ms. Alcorn, why are you here? 
And it never occurred to Claudia. And she said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, we're all here because we got in trouble. What did you do? <laughs> Claudia saw this as an opportunity. And she said, well, I, I, I don't like to talk about it. And he said, no, really, what did you do? No, I, I don't talk about it. No, Ms. Alcorn, what did you do? So finally she said, well, <clears throat> I killed a student. <laughs> but I, I don't talk about it. I want you to know she had no trouble with that kid <laughs> all year long. In fact, he became one of her best advocates, told all the other, stu all the other kids in, in, in the alternative school, you don't mess with that lady. You do not mess with her, and I can't tell you why, but do not mess with Ms. Alcorn. Now, at the end of the year, she told the student that that was all just a joke, that it didn't really happen. But to this day, Dr. Don Corley, who is the psychologist in Waco that meets with all the first year teachers in WISD, Waco Independent School District, he tells that story to those first year teachers just so they'll know that sometimes you have to be creative to take control of your classroom. But in, in those years of teaching alternative school, six years in Waco, we got to Louisiana, they didn't have alternative school, and they asked Claudia to start it in, in the town where we lived, in DeRitter, and, and then a year or two on her campus here in Abilene. She's taught the alternative classroom. All those years, I've never once heard her complain, not once, about any of her students. You think there were days when she was disappointed in some of their behaviors? Of course. Some of their language? Absolutely. Some of their attitudes? Some of their parents? Yeah, disappointing. There were days she faced unusually hard challenges. I know there were, but she knew that was the case when she signed up for that. She knew it would be that way, and so she doesn't complain about it. She never has. So we, as a responsible teacher, she kept the best interests of her students at heart, did her best to teach them, did her best to love them. One of the right things we're called to do is accept the consequences of our decisions, accept the consequences of our failures, our bad decisions, or our good decisions, sometimes good decisions, bring great challenges as well. Do you remember the name Joe Nathan? He was a pitcher, a 16-year career in the majors, pretty good career for a major league pitcher. He was with several different teams, pitched for the Rangers. He was a closer uh, in the later years of his career. He pitched for the Detroit Tigers about five years ago. I remember watching a game one night where he came in with a, an 8-4 to four lead in the top of the ninth inning. The Tigers were playing an interleague game with uh, 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 Pittsburgh Pirates. He had a four-run lead, but it had been a tough year for him. He'd blown six saves already. He came in and walked the first two batters, and then the third guy got a home run. So now it's 8-7, to seven and they pull him, and he's in the dugout, and he just goes bonkers. You've seen this happen. He starts raking all the batting helmets off the shelf. He gets a bat and starts beating up on a water cooler. I'm sure he said things that he shouldn't have said. The next day, he made an apology. But I heard an announcer say, we need to applaud Joe Nathan for not coming out and saying, if my actions offended anyone, I'm sorry. That's not what he said. Joe Nathan said, what I did was wrong. I was wrong. And I'm sorry. He said, I have two sons, and that's not the example I want to set. One day my boys will grow up, and they will see me on YouTube. They'll see what I did last night, and I don't want them thinking that's who their dad is. I want them to know I don't approve of that kind of behavior. I was wrong. I'm sorry. You know what that is? That's doing the right thing. That's taking responsibility and accepting consequences. So when you're tempted to complain, just remember, life's difficult for just about everybody. Everybody's going through a rough time. And if you're willing to accept the rewards of your hard work and the opportunities that you've taken advantage of, you've got to learn how to accept your failures as well. In fact, we usually learn more through our failures than we do through our successes. Jesus said, Martha, you're worried. You're just upset about so many things. There's only a few things that are really important. In fact, today, Martha, there's just one thing that's important. And your sister Mary, she's chosen that one thing. And it'll never be taken from her. 
Remember, it's much more important to always do the right thing than to do things perfectly right. Former Congressman Brooks Hayes told the story of a boy named Otto. He was in elementary school. He was the biggest kid in his class. In fact, he was, he was kind of too big almost for his age. He was clumsy. He uh, couldn't keep up with studies. He just had a hard time all the way around. One day, some administrators from the school district were visiting the school where Otto attended. They were just spot checking on some classes and walked into Otto's class. Teacher immediately recognized who they were. And in a minute or two, she said, Otto, would you please go back to the back of the class and raise those windows? And as he did so, she said, you know, I'm so glad Otto's in this class. I, I don't know what I'd do without him. He's the only boy strong enough to raise those windows. A little while later, when the students had left the classroom, one of those visitors came back and said to the teacher, those windows really didn't need raising, did they? She smiled and said, no, but Otto needed the recognition. That's a teacher who's not just doing things right. She's doing the right thing. Parents and students and teachers and coaches and counselors Administrators, bus drivers, we start this new school year and throughout this year. Let's pray that God would grant us the wisdom to know the right thing to do and that he would give us the grace to do it. So like Mary, we make the right choice and we major on making the right choice doing the right things for his glory. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we have opportunities more perhaps than we need, but they're out there. Give us your wisdom to choose wisely, to make certain that what we do matters blesses the lives of other people. It's something responsible. Help us to be trustworthy in doing it. Lord, we don't want to waste our lives. We have just so much time. Help us to use it for your glory. As Paul says, to redeem the time for the sake of the kingdom. And again, we ask your blessings on our teachers and administrators and all those that are working with the youth of Abilene and the big country, God bless them. Give them the wisdom to look to you for strength and courage and guidance, compassion, love. Bless them at home. Bless them in their work. Bless them here. Help us to be encouragers for them as they seek to be encouragers for the next generation. We leave them in your hands. In Jesus' name, we pray and praise you. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing that hymn of commitment, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. As we sing it, if God's been doing a work in your life this week and you've been wanting to respond to him, if, if maybe today in Bible study or in worship, through the music, through the preaching, through the teaching, the reading of God's word, maybe God's done something in your heart, in your life, and you need to respond. We had a couple here from Alaska. He's from North Carolina. She's from California. Uncle Sam is taking them to Alaska, husband and wife. He's now in Abilene because of Dias Air Force Base. And, and uh when he heard three weeks ago, they heard that we needed some Sunday school teachers. They said, we taught in Alaska, we can teach in Abilene. And they're teaching four-year-olds right now. But they joined this morning, the Jordans. You want to meet Annie and James Jordan. They're ready to serve the Lord. Maybe God's speaking to you about some area of ministry. Maybe somebody shared Jesus with you this week and you trusted him as your Savior. And you want to come and make that public. However God might be leading, this is a good time to respond. I'll be here to receive you. Pastor Jeff is here. Most importantly, the Lord's waiting. Don't keep him waiting. You come as we sing together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee.
call of God in Christ Jesus. Good day. God bless you.